So uh, my focus now is uh, quite narrowly, well, it's actually quite fundamental, so it's not such a narrow topic, but specifically on the invisible hand. This was written for a separate occasion, and hence the intersection that I referred to earlier, which I will jump across here as well. So the background of it is this. In 2019, I had the honour of being invited to contribute a new entry on the invisible hand for the new Palgrave Dictionary, and they kindly gave me 10,000 words, so uh, effectively a, a essay length entry and showing the enormous self-restraint for which I am justly famous. <laughs> I managed to keep it to 9,000 words. And so I used this occasion to uh, revisit that, uh, that, that essay of four years ago or so, and to sharpen up some points there where I was a bit more muted. Uh, and so what I've done here is to go to the specifics of two of the three instances where Smith actually uses the metaphor. He actually uses the phrase invisible hand. The third one, which is from that uh, essay on astronomy that I referred to earlier, is really, I think, not relevant and not quite relevant and can be put aside. So I, I want to uh, uh, just show you what he actually says and then suggest that uh, what he says is not very credible or interesting and that therefore, if that was all there was to it, the invisible hand would not amount to much. But that in fact, there's a whole other body of unintended consequences arguments which are much more significant than the two instances where he actually uses the, the, the very words. And then at the end, I've, I've done something that I didn't do at all in the 2020 New Palgrave, which is to say a little bit about positioning Smith's unintended consequences in the larger context of social science more generally by referring to Marx, Keynes and Hyman Minsky to give instances of unintended consequences which come from a very different politico-economic perspective to, to, to po provide that larger context. So to go to uh, the first instance which is Well, let me give you first my definition of the invisible hand, my formal definition. This is taken directly from that new Palgrave entry. The action of an unseen causal process in which behaviour at the level of individuals generates systemic outcomes or effects at the level of the economy and polity as a whole. Furthermore, those outcomes are conceived of as being not part of the intention of the individual level behaviour that is their ultimate cause and with the causal processes commonly unrecognised by the individuals. <clears throat> and the first instance is in the theory of moral sentiments. In the TMS, narrative, a selfish landlord, notwithstanding his selfishness, is led to distribute the harvest of his estates so as to provide the necessaries of life to all the thousands he directly and indirectly employs. The moral of the story is that in this manner, the rich are led by an invisible hand to make nearly the same distribution of the necessaries of life which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions among all of its inhabitants and thus without intending it, without knowing it, advance the interest of the society and afford means to the multiplication of the species. The advancing of society that Smith refers to here is via the spectacle of the rich and the great being a stimulus to the industry of mankind. This is due to there being a natural human tendency to admire wealth and greatness, a tendency that in Smith's view is foolish but also useful. This is something that Lisa Hill also referred to. And the unintended system level consequence is a sort of equality, 
with respect to basic subsistence consumption. Note also that the state of affairs sketched here does not necessarily belong uniquely to a capitalist social economy, liberal, competitive or otherwise. This has got nothing to do with competition. Yeah? Indeed, the picture painted conveys a, distinct feudal, a distinctly feudal context. In a way, this is unsurprising because uh, there is no capital in Smith's thinking until after his time spent in France, as I've sketched in, at some length in my first presentation. Now I turn to the, wealth, the, instance, the second instance, which is in the Wealth of Nations. In the WN instance, capital is central. Against discriminatory mercantilist policies, Smith argues that individuals' pursuit of individual economic advantage, unrestricted by such policies, will generate superior outcomes. Individuals are continually exerting themselves continually exerting themselves to apply their capital to the most advantageous employment for themselves, but in doing so are led to prefer that employment which is most advantageous to the society. The fundamental societal advantage that Smith focuses upon is the aggregate produce or annual revenue of a society. The key step in the argument is his supposition that the pursuit of maximum profitability of capital leads to capital being employed in support of that industry of which the produce is likely to be of the greatest value. As every individual, therefore, en endeavours as much as he can to employ his capital so that it pr its produce may be of the greatest value, every individual necessarily Every, every individual necessarily labours to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally, indeed, neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting. He intends only his own gain, and in this way, as in many other cases, as in many other cases, he's led by an invisible hand to promote an end, which was no part of his intention. So there's the two explicit cases of the invisible hand metaphor being used. How much intellectual significance can be given to these two? In the TNS case, the notion of equality in terms of fundamental material subsistence seems rather forced, to say the least. In that narrative, Smith frankly states that the landlord's share is prepared in the nicest manner, consumed in his palace, and is the most precious and agreeable share. These are all quotes. When, if or when you get the written text, you will see this with page citations. And the claim of equality stands in sharp contrast to the considerable acknowledgments of profound economic inequality elsewhere in his writings. Smith was surely self-aware that this unintended equality argument is at best rhetorical overstatement. In the WN case, the argument requires two steps. The first is that individuals' maximisation of revenue or value added maximises society's revenue or value added on the basis that the latter is a mere aggregation of the former. Hardly a profound proposition, almost trite, and spurious if there are interdependencies as arise from negative externalities. The second, the above mentioned key step, is the supposition that maximising profits per unit of capital invested maximises product or revenue or value added per unit of capital invested, which is also problematic.
page 71. In relation to this second proposition, on the one hand, it is not precisely clear what revenue concept Smith intends. Gross revenue or some measure of net revenue? At one point, he speaks of maximizing revenue and labor employment, implying gross revenue, since the quantity of labor employed generated by production aligns with gross revenue more than net revenue. But at the same page, the produce of industry, said to be in proportion to profits, is identified with what it adds to the subject or materials upon which it is employed, which is clearly a value-added or net revenue concept. Perhaps he believes that maximising the rate of profit ensures maximisation of both revenue magnitudes. <coughs> On the other hand, it is not in any case in general valid that maximising the rate of profit on capital maximises revenue, whether gross or net. As between two methods of production available to a producer, the method generating a higher rate of profit need not be associated with also a higher ratio of revenue or value of output to capital. <coughs> and so I've used this little uh, identity to make the point. So, what, what Smith is telling is the capital, this is the behavioural principle is that the capitalist maximises this profit per unit of capital invested. And what he wants to tell is that that will be associated with maximising the reciprocal of this. The reciprocal of capital over revenue is, is revenue to, to, per dollar of capital invested. Well, you can see from the identity that there is the intervention in, the, in the, the relationship between the profit rate on the left and the second term on the right. There is the intervention of the share of profit in revenue, the profit, the profit share. It is possible then for there to be no uh, uh, coincidence of profit maximisation with revenue maximisation. A production method that exhibits a higher profit rate than an alternative production method, the left-hand side, can be associated with a higher capital output ratio or lower output capital ratio, the second term on the right-hand side, so long as this is associated also with a more than proportionally higher profit share, the first term on the, on the right-hand side. Whether the measure of revenue or value of output is a gross measure or some form of net, net measure. <coughs> now, I don't want to get too technical here because what, what I've gone on to do in the written paper is give an algebraic illustration of this point. But it's actually very simple. Imagine there are two different production methods, one which uses more capital relative to labour compared to the other. It may be that a production method with a higher capital per unit of output at the same time generates a higher profit rate because the quantity of labour per unit of output falls so dramatically that the profit share rises as well. Yeah? So it doesn't require anything very fancy. Yeah? Capital labour substitution with a sufficient fall in labour per unit of output as capital per unit of output rises can enable revenue per dollar of capital to fall as the profit rate per dollar of capital rises. Now, you might think, well, Tony, Adam Smith is, a, is an intellectual giant. He's a lot smarter than you. You really found a mistake in Adam Smith? Because you're a little intellectual midget and he's a giant. It's true. It's true. I'm a midget and he's a giant. But there's the old thing associated with Isaac Newton, though it goes back much earlier, about standing on the shoulders of giants. And there's another giant called Ricardo. And I can stand on Ricardo's shoulders and see a little bit further than Adam Smith. Because 
It would be generally accepted that Ricardo is a superior analytical economist to Adam Smith about a generation later, say 40 years. Yeah? There's this famous thing in Ricardo where in the third edition of Ricardo's Principles, he engages in a recantation. He adds a chapter at the very end of the book on machinery and it caused a huge stir because it seemed to provide a vindication of the Luddites. Because what he argued was, it's true that the introduction of new machinery can be detrimental to the interests of the working class. Now, the great analytical economist Ricardo had not noticed something, which he finally noticed for the third edition. And in, if you get my written text, page four, note four, I've, I've written, along with something else, compare also David Ricardo's change of mind on the impact of new and more profitable production methods in the chapter 31 on machinery added in the third edition of the principles. Quote, my mistake arose from the supposition that whenever the net income of a society increased, its gross income would also increase. This is essentially the same distinction that I'm drawing here, although in a different context uh, in relation to the invisible hand. <clears throat> well, I figure I have got until 10 past. So, if these two instances of the invisible, this is my conclusion, if these two instances of the invisible hand metaphor explicitly invoked were the only cases of Smith's theorising unintended systemic consequences, the concept could be judged of little significance, both for Smith's thought and for social science in general. But the idea has much greater application for Smith. And recall that when applying the metaphor in WN, Smith himself speaks, as I quoted it, of there being many other instances Many other cases is the phrase he uses. What I've gone on to highlight is the two of these further cases that are of particular significance and indeed of greater significance than the two instances in which the metaphor is actually used. Well, <clears throat> the first instance is that uh, thing that I discussed in the, the first session about the famous one that everyone uh, appeals to of how price flexibility in a decentralised competitive economy spontaneously, in inverted commas, brings about a coordination of supply and demand. And I won't uh, labour the point here. The second, of course, is the one that I did emphasise then uh, to, to, uh, to, to prefigure uh, the, its central role here, which is to say that it's actually economic development itself which is an unintended consequence of fundamental propensities of human nature. And, and this is the central uh, issue and theme for, for Smith in, in The Wealth of Nations. So I go on to tell, see this stuff was the stuff I did this morning. This is just astonishing. <laughs> astonishing. Not only, <clears throat> not only is the theory of economic development far more important for Smith than the supply-demand coordination theory, economic development and all that is supposed to flow from it in his view, notably rising output per worker and widely distributed rising consumption per capita, is itself a case of unintended systemic consequences of individuals' pursuit of material self-betterment. Quote, the principle from which public and national, as well as private opulence, is originally derived, unquote. Quote, the principle which prompts to save, unquote. And the most important instance for him, an element of this is the technical progress associated with Smith's doctrine concerning the benefits of labour specialisation, this division of labour thing we've been hearing about all day. 
which is also an unintended systemic consequence of individuals' pursuit of material self-betterment, together with a supposed natural human propensity to trade, and is one of the two proximate causes of the economic development, which is Smith's ultimate economic objective the other cause being capital accumulation. Quote, the vision of labour is not originally the effect of any human wisdom which foresees and intends that general opulence to which it gives occasion, unquote. General opulence here is Smith's term for economic development that delivers widely distributed rising consumption per capita. A theme also pursued by Lisa Hill. The supply-demand coordination theory is really only of derivative importance insofar as that coordination contributes to the advancement of economic development. For example, competition ensuring that falling costs of production from innovation, itself attributed to competition here, flow through to prices. Here's the, the quote. This is from WN. Increase of demand though in the beginning it may sometimes raise the price of goods, never fails to lower it in the long run. It encourages production and thereby increases the competition of the producers, who in order to undersell one another, have recourse to new divisions of labour and new improvements of art, which might never otherwise have been thought of." Unquote. Well, uh, the remainder of the page or two uh, is devoted to that uh, last thing I mentioned, which is, say, the invisible hand in Smith appears as essentially a economic liberal conceptualization. He's actually a bit more <laughs> cautious than that, as some people have indicated, like the problems with division of labor for the degeneration of the workers uh, human qualities and so on. But nevertheless, it's essentially an economic liberal vision that, uh, that Smith's unintended consequences captures. But you, you need to keep in mind that arguments about unintended consequences have a much larger domain in social science than, than that. In my 2020 essay, I connect the invisible hand idea to Smith's characterization of science as well, and I, I don't have time to go into this. But to summarize it, Smith has a conception of science as uncovering hidden chains of causation. This is the sort of language he uses in the, in the uh, essay on astronomy. Hidden chain, chains of causation, and from that vantage point, invisible hand or unintended consequences arguments appear as insights of social science, commonly not evident to the actual participating individuals whose behaviour generates the causal process. Then I turn to Marx, Keynes and Minsky, and, and then I'll, I'll finish on this note to give you an in, some instances of, of uh, wider unintended consequences. Marx famously conjectured a tendency towards capitalism self-destructing. If it were to occur, well and truly, a systemic consequence, to put it mildly. Importantly, this is a theory in which the outcome is a result of forces arising from within the logic of capitalism itself not due to exogenous shocks to the system. One may, in what is a typical retort, disparage Marx's conjecture as having proven to be spectacularly wrong. But I think the underlying core idea that liberal capitalism has forces within it that are endogenously destabilizing of it, that liberal capitalism carries within it the seeds of its own potential destruction is a proposition that remains of enduring relevance. Indeed, this seems to be widely accepted today and not only by those well to the left on the political spectrum. This is so even if the further supposition that this destabilization 
either will or should lead to highly centralised socialist states is a much deader idea. Observing some global trends in politics over recent years, rather than socialism, the destabilisation of liberal capitalism might lead to illiberal capitalism. Of the many sources Thomas Piketty quotes in his much celebrated 2014 book, my favourite is from Josiah Wedgwood, 1939. Quote, political democracies that do not democratise their economic systems are inherently unstable, unquote. In relation to Keynes, the most striking case of adverse unintended systemic consequences is the paradox of thrift. It can be illustrated with the following scenario. Suppose that the household sector of an economic system undergoes an across the board shift in preferences for saving versus current consumption, resulting in increasing rates of saving out of incomes across the board. In the jargon, an increase in the system propensity to save. The resulting decline in aggregate consumption expenditure at initial income levels leads to an amplified contraction in aggregate economic activity and thereby aggregate income via the multiplier. For any given level of aggregate investment, aggregate income will contract until the level of aggregate saving is restored to equality with the level of investment, planned saving and investment to be precise. Furthermore, if aggregate investment actually falls in response to the decline in consumption expenditures, which is more than possible, the level of saving must fall as well. The rise in the propensity to save has led to either no change or a lower level of saving. Rates of saving have increased, but now out of lower income levels. The lack of an adequate co coordination mechanism in Keynes's view is what leads to his conviction that a social democratic policy regime was required to save capitalism from itself. Finally, there's Minsky's uh, financial instability hypothesis. It's a further distinct form of endogenous destabilisation, although it's considerably inspired by Keynes. Essentially, the argument is that financial stability encourages behaviour that then destabilises the system. Well, that's it for me. Uh, you'll be relieved to know. Um, I want to emphasise, though, that the, the significance of these Marx, Keynes, Minsky is not uh, that you should believe them, although I look rather favourably on them myself, but just to show that there's a lot more going on about unintended consequences in social science than the economic liberal kind of Adam Smith invisible hand thing. That's, that was really the point I wanted to emphasise. Well, I was going to say, Tony, you can have the rest of the day off, but actually there's the panel as well afterwards, so no, you can't. We do have time for a few questions. I've got one from Doug here, but I'm going to go to the back first, and uh, we'll take one there. Lisa, do you have a microphone? No. Thank you for your presentation. I have a simple question. Could Where... you stand up? Sorry. I have a simple question. Where is God in your system? Because in a previous presentation, we saw a quotation from the theory of moral sentiments that all these beneficial consequences should not be ascribed to human wisdom, but to divine wisdom, the wisdom of God. So my question is, is the invisible hand, is that meant to be the hand of God? In, in, the, uh, in the 2020 um Palgrave Dictionary entry that I wrote, there's another section at the end um, called Some Other Interpretations. And one of the three that I examine is the idea that uh, God is playing some important role in uh, Adam Smith's Invisible Hand story. <clears throat> it's a bit of a controversial subject, but uh, in my view, 
God uh, plays no role in Adam Smith's social theory. I could say a lot more about this, but I won't. Other <laughs> <laughs> questions here? Thanks, um, If you step back from economic systems to look at complex adaptive systems in general. Um, the way I've always seen Smith and his use of the concept of his invisible hand as, as, a, as a rhetorical metaphor to try, he's struggling, again to me, he's struggling with what a complex system is, how it actually operates, how it, how it evolves. Um, so to, to me it's about emergent properties. Um, so the develop, economic development you referred to is a, an unintended consequence of, of people's propensity to truck and truck. Mm -hmm. um, so to me it's a very positive thing. I mean, your latter use of the terminology unintended consequences, to me at least, seems to tend towards perception that or view that may be negative. Um, they are just consequences. How we react to them, uh, we may see them as positive and negative. Um, in terms of an innovation and entrepreneurial perspective, one should always try and look at those unintended consequences of lower level, uh, well, of emerging complexity, let's call it, um, as potential positives um, and ameliorate the negative impacts. But to me, he's, again, he's struggling to comprehend and describe processes which um, you know, humanity was only just starting to try and contemplate. I mean, more, I mean, in this century, last century, of course, it's now under the, the guise of complex system theory. Um, and, and to me, economics is just another one of those complex systems. You would know more about these things than I do, um, so I'm not inclined to, to uh, joust on that. But, but I, I do think that Smith thinks that he understands the invisible causal processes, I think. He's, it's not being used by him to say, hey, there's something going on we mightn't fully understand. He thinks he understands the, these things, and I think he does. Uh, so I'm not sure that your track is exact, exactly, I mean, what you would say is very interesting, and it sounds plausible to me, right? But I'm not sure Adam Smith is on track with you on this. But. Thanks very much. How would have been? Uh, thanks, Tony. Just a question on sort of the intellectual history of this idea. Sorry. Just turn off. Okay. Um, I, I know. I always just assumed that the, you know, the power of this idea was always sort of in contrast to the command economy version of communism that we we got. But certainly, you know, in the United States. When I, when I, this phrase pops up all the time, and people are just, I, I always understood it as being, you know, this comparison to how disastrous a, a planned economy is. Like, am I wrong? Is that, is that not where the, 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 the power, the, um, did it have a, an intellectual legacy before communism? I guess. I think, uh, I think on this subject, there's a great deal of work which I'm not closely engaged with on the images of Adam Smith. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a second order scholarship. It's like, not what, what, what was Adam Smith about, but what did this generation think <laughs> was the significance of Adam Smith? So you see, I, I think this is not relativism or, or solipsism. I think every generation, um, for a big thinker, fundamental and wide thinker like Smith, every generation, if it wants to, if it has the curiosity, can bring its own questions to the man, right, or to the texts or to the corpus of writings. And so Adam Smith can look to be changing shape from generation to generation. So the invisible hand as decentralised um, um, market equilibrium spontaneously became a kind of motif of general equilibrium theory during the period of its, uh, its, its dominance in the decades immediately after World War II. So you're gonna, I, I quote a couple of them in the entry. Uh, the first uh, chapter of every GE textbook 
is invisible hand Adam Smith, you know. Um, you know, we're the, we're the inheritors of that, right? Yeah, uh, it's not really post-communism. Uh, uh, mm. I would agree on that, but the 19th century had a little interest in uh, the 19th century political economy had little interest in the invisible hand. It was only at the very end of the 19th century when people started thinking about, well, how would a socialist economy work? Could it work? That there was a certain growth in interest. That would be my impression. I have to say. Oh, I, I couldn't agree well, with that. I understand your point, but that's, that's taking the particular uh, supply-demand coordinations and saying this is the thing. Well, I'm saying this is not the thing. This is just one little part of, the, of a, even for Smith, a, a larger thing. But I was going to add that I think Emma Rothschild's book uh, called Economic Sentiments, I think she traces the history of the invisible hand, the understanding of the invisible hand through generations. So she's actually done some of that second order kind of, you know, how, how have people read it for their own interests, right? Uh, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an imperfect book, like all books, but uh, it's a very good book as well. Uh, yeah, but I, I was going to say, uh, in relation to Wh William, see, there's this common motif in Marx, appearance and reality. Yeah? There's the appearance of capitalism, and then there's the reality of capitalism hidden behind the surface. This, I'm sure, derives from Smith, the invisible hand, maybe via Hegel, yeah, because we know that the, the Smith-Marx connection all goes directly, but it also goes through Hegel. So, so there are resonances, I think, uh, that, that go deeper. Tony, if I may ask a question very briefly. Uh, in your first talk, you raised, but then skipped over the question of how original Adam Smith was. And I know that there's a tendency to think, you know, we needed economics and God said, let there be Adam Smith sort of thing. Um, but apropos of the invisible hand in particular, is this an original Smithian notion? What about this stuff about the fable of the bees and all that kind of thing? Uh, well, is there an invisible hand in the fable of the bees? I'm trying to remember, that's why I'm asking you, you're the expert. I'm asking the questions here. <laughs> William knows well, more about man of his private advice is public virtue. Jeez. Smith is not saying private, not really saying private advice is public virtues. He's saying, um, in, the, in the interpretation which Tony is not disagreeing with, he's saying there's rationality in the system despite there being no system wide coordination. The, look, there's a lot of stories about the, the invisible hand pre Smith. I don't know much about that, but, uh, but one is that the metaphor comes from the opera. There's some kind of op operatic construct that is about the invisible hand backstage or something. But this is just about the metaphor, not about the content of the idea. So. Okay, anyway. We might quick it's there for afternoon tea. We're on the, that we kind of... Take a couple more? Okay. We're, we've got more questions? One more. Radio, right, yeah, let's fire it. Um, I'll confess I'm not certain how to ask this question, but on the point, on your point of a move to illiberal uh, democracy, if one takes a, a Gaullist view, that's to say that democracy is a means of legitimizing a leader or a party as opposed to where the leader of the party derived their power. Is it is somehow democracy a, a product of liberalism or, or so? Uh, I, As I say, I'm not sure. I think the elements of Smith's liberalism are logically separable from democracy in the sense of majority rule. So I think it can be considered separately from the question of democracy, if you mean it in that crude sense of majority rule. Um, it requires the rule of law and so on and due process and all that. <laughs> but it doesn't really require, 
I mean, you might say, well, can we really have all that stuff without some kind of democratic uh, lever? Well, maybe, maybe not. But I'm saying logically they're separable, right? <laughs> logically they're separable. So uh, this, biz this business about Gaulism, this is, uh, I'm just an economist. I, I can't help you with that. Any more questions? Yes, one down there. Hi, um, thanks for your talk. Um, just a question about the invisible hand and sort of these forces inside capitalism that might bring it to its to its end. You talked about the invisible hand always moving towards sort of the betterment of society, lower prices, etc. But with things like inflation and money printing and these kinds of things, is this kind of a a chafing conflict between? the forces of the invisible hand and sort of the forces of, say, government and, and these things which could bring an end. Is that the kind of internal force that you're talking about or is it different? Oh, no, 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 no. Look, to have a genuine uh, invisible hand argument for the self-destructiveness of capitalism, the behaviours generating the destructiveness have got to come from the capitalists. <laughs> If it's come from the government, when they say, well, there, you see, we told you. We told you not to trust them. Yeah, so it can't be a government action that, just, that is destructive of capitalism. That's not going to compromise economic liberalism. That's going to be a sort of vindication, yeah? I guess my question is that if, say, if capitalists have access to more money, say, which drives up the price of goods, then it would be the capitalists who are sort of creating that shape in that um, they are incentivised to to use that extra capital, et cetera, et cetera. Not just on them, but that they would do it. But that that whole force moving forward would move against the innovations that capitalism produces. So you would get innovation price decrease, but then it would come up against inflation I think I think you're looking for arguments that are not going to work very well. I think they're much more straightforward things to tell. You know, look, we don't have time for it, but hey, people get really rich, they decide they'll buy a political party. And it's like, well if I if I own a political party, I can own the government. If I can own the government, why do I have to obey the law? And that destroys the system. Hey, simple. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>